Well, pleased to be here again. Um, well, to meet many of you again after I, I hope that a ice cream was a good selling point. So unfortunately, today, no ice cream. Uh, well, um, as, as Miriam said, I'm Hernan Fernandez. I'm a managing partner for Angel Ventures Mexico. Um, and uh, well, we, we set up in 2008 as the first professionally managed angel investor network. Um, you, you just heard the uh, Yuri Navarro, uh, a good friend of ours, talking. So I, I am I, I am sure that you are now quite acquainted with what is an angel investor and what is he looking for, uh, the fact that the, he's bringing smart money to the table, etc. Uh, well, but I I would like you to 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 imagine what the ecosystem was like in Mexico in 2008. Um, the fact is that Mexicans have, have always been very creative, uh, very, very, very passionate. It's, it's a big country, it's 120 million people, and there's tons of opportunity, which I'm certain that you have recently attested in, in uh, during these this past visits. Um, and Angel Ventures was basically burned out uh, uh, from an initiative at MIT. So me and my partner, we, at the time, were participating in the 100K business plan competition. Um, you know, uh, getting in touch with entrepreneurs and everything. And when when we were coming back to Mexico, we we knew that we were going to miss the action of the, the thrill and excitement of investing the, the best new thing, right? Um, so with that in mind, we we did like a very you know blunt exercise of linking uh, entrepreneurs with high net worth individuals and. Simply, the process happened as you know uh, very organically because I guess both me and my partner we knew we knew entrepreneurs that were trying to raise money for uh, an interesting, challenging, and challenging idea in the country, and we both knew people that might have the money or the resources to fund some of these ideas. So we started like doing these breakfasts, and then they started like getting bigger and bigger, and there were no now people who were not my friends or whom I previously have not met. And they wanted into the breakfast, right? So at that point in time, it made sense. This was a great year to, to become an entrepreneur, 2008. Everything was booming, right? Um, yeah, no, I mean, notwithstanding the, the, the global crisis that was going on. So a perfect time to, to become an entrepreneur. But the things started like growing and growing, and, and we started like getting some traction. We, we wrote our, our first checks. Uh, and next thing we knew, we, we had funded successfully one of the companies. We helped bring smart money to that to that company, and then a second company got funded. And by the end of 2000, uh, uh, 2012, we had funded 13 companies with a total of $10 million. A couple of our liars, which, because the usual round that we were funding were 300k to 400k US. Uh, two companies actually got in total $5 million, which w was kind of strange for the moment, but nevertheless exciting. And at some point in time, um, some investors came to us and told me, you know, Hernan, you have processes, you have pipeline. We like what you do. Uh, we would like you to invest 100K, 200K, 300K on our behalf. And that was a, a big cue for us because from there, we, we could certainly uh, believe ourselves to, to, to be a... Uh, oh, it's... Yeah, so it's... está proyectando? From there, we can certainly um, believe in the idea that we could be the fund. Uh, we were lucky because this is the Angel Ventures Co-Investment Fund 1. It's a fund that has a, the Inter-American Development Bank, the Mexican Development Bank, a local fund of funds, and 50 uh, angel investors. The checks range a lot. Um, some of, of them are actually here with us today. Uh, and I can certainly say that I love working with angels because the, the smart capital that they bring into the table doesn't have a price. And we can, you know, they're, they're constantly people uh, advocating for solutions for companies. They are uh, people who constantly challenge ideas or projects from the entrepreneurs, which makes them better. They participate in many of our own committees in order to select or to, to help with the business development of these committees. But they also are constant mystery shopper and explore ideas because they feel part of the team. And I think that any successful organization that deals with entrepreneurs or angels have to make the, the, the rest of the constituencies or the, the key stakeholders in the ecosystem, they need to be part of the team. And, and that's definitely my... My job number one, now that we're embarking on this new adventure of, of, uh, of raising a 
substantially larger fund, uh, a fund too that we're targeting $120 million to invest in the Pacific Alliance region. Uh, it's definitely not, not an easy task, but hopefully we have the right team, the, the right skills. I think Mexico is at a, at the, at a good time to, to embark on an adventure like this, and hopefully we also have a, a good support of our, of our entrepreneurs and, and of our investors. So Angel Ventures, as I, I said before, uh, we run an, uh, the Disco Investment Fund. It's a small uh, fund for, I mean, for venture capital standards because it aims to, in to invest alongside angel investors. Um, it was a $20 million fund at the time. We also have the Angel Ventures Network. That's uh, a, an angel network of over 250 people. And what's really interesting is we have a, a very interesting collection of CEOs, CTOs, CMOs, uh, country managers for, for different companies, uh, you know, not very publics, uh, lawyers, etc. That that really add to this fantastic mix of people that are vouching for these these entrepreneurs. We have a, a, a high impact incubator which we call Archetype, which basically aims to support all of those entrepreneurs that are too early or too nascent and bring many of those ideas into action and into companies that might get some traction and then being plugged in either into the angel uh, investor network or the fund. And we finally, we have this Academy for Investors, which is a training program that we do for investors, right? Because regardless of how smart investors are sometimes in, in these markets, they do not derive their wealth from entrepreneurial activities. So getting a, or explaining to them what is a term sheet, what is a convertible note, what is a warrant, uh, it's sometimes not an easy task. And, and, and many times there, these are many instru instruments that are unheard of. Because here's an interesting statistic for, for all of you that join us from Canada and the US, which is 80% of angel investors in the US and Canada have been successful entrepreneurs or derive their wealth from an entrepreneurial activity. Either you were an early employee in Facebook or in Google uh, or you were a serial entrepreneur that has gone through the full cycle of creating a, uh, a company, raising capital, uh, and then liquidating that capital and getting some money, and then you're ready to give back to the ecosystem. But that not, that's not necessarily true in, in emerging markets, and in Latin America particularly, and we can certainly say that for Mexico, where a lot of this money is concentrated in older families, right? We all know that Slim is one of the, the largest men in the world, uh, and and we we know that many of the, the main uh, families that, that still control much wealth, the fact is that we're now talking to the grand grandsons or granddaughters of these great families, and it's not as easy to connect with them as entrepreneurs. So that's why we, we have approached this as a crowd funding of source, but on real time and with real people that are now fostering and investing in the next great wave of Mexican entrepreneurs. We also do a bunch of workshops uh, with the U.S. Embassy. We have created a, a very interesting uh, course on intellectual property in order for entrepreneurs to understand what's like a PCT or what's a patent or, or, or how to uh, really protect your intellectual property. And we also have a format for entrepreneurs which, which has been very successful and basically it aims to create a business plan within a day. Uh, we do a lot of events and workshops. We, we manage uh, a, the Mexico City Tech Tour which uh, coincidentally was here last week. So we tour them around research centers, uh, Telmex Innovation Lab, Simbestab, universities, meetups with, with entrepreneurs, a visit to Mass Challenge or to WIDA or to 500 startups. So it was quite exciting to, to bring all these people together who were mainly investors, uh, media, and entrepreneurs into the mix. Uh, I'm having issues with the maps, probably not loading too well. Oh, there we go. And yeah, and this has also a come into play with kind of like our, our, uh, our footprint because we have headquarters are here in Mexico City. We also operate from Guadalajara and we also have a fully fledged office in Lima, Peru. Uh, and now we're also launching in Colombia and some of the other places that, that you might see that are, are spot in the map is because we have a local partner that helps us with the pipeline of, of projects and also uh, trying to find a critical mass of investors. Um, okay, I have gone a little bit uh, through the story, but since 2008 we have grown from an angel investor network, part of the Angel Capital Association, the Latin American Venture Capital Association, etc. And we have continued to grow both as an angel investor network and as a fund. And, uh, and this might be interesting because, uh, you know, despite that Mexico might not be considered uh, like an innovation hub, 
we are truly seeing great and very innovative products. We're seeing Mexico has always been a powerhouse in, uh, in smart manufacturing. So to no one's surprise, we're seeing a lot of products in drones or we're seeing uh, many products in Internet of Things that really make good use of, of the, the great engineers that we have in Mexico. Uh, we're seeing a lot of financial technology deals. I think this derives from the fact that banks are sometimes doing a, a terrible job of empowering a, the next generation of consumers. And as you might probably know, Mexico is a huge market for uh, a microfinance institutions. Arguably the, the most valuable microfinance uh, bank in the world is actually Mexican, which is Gentera or Compartamos. So uh, definitely there are certain trends where, where Mexico can be really, really competitive and we're, we're looking into many of these. The fact that this is a, a relatively big market with 120 million people or that we are arguably one of the most open economies in the world with 52, tree, uh, 52 free trade agreements. Um, and also Mexico has come on age, a uh, come of age in terms of regulatory uh, conditions. Back in 1995, you know, with the big peso crisis, I think that this country did learn their lesson, right? From that moment on, the, the, the central bank was independent. The peso was uh, sent over in a floating uh, structure. And the peso has since remained a very, uh, like a currency hedge for major economies. And to no one's surprise, today the peso is actually one of the top 10 currencies that is, is most, uh, mostly traded in the world. Uh, which, you know, with, with certain nervousism of, uh, of a candidate in the U.S., you can see the peso fluctuations being up and down because even Citibank published a paper that said that if you want to, to hedge against a, a Trump presidency, bet against the Mexican peso. So I, I, I also believe, as many senior economists in the country, that uh, the Mexican peso is, is a bit overvalued. But, I mean, that, that must say a little bit about how open the economy is how uh, NAFTA has also made us grow in terms of the ease of doing business. And obviously there's a lot of challenges that we still have to overcome in terms of transparency, in terms of corruption, uh, in terms of many demons that still come to us. But, but I think we're seeing like the dawn of a new Mexico and the dawn of, you know, Mexicans being super com competitive in the world and really wanted to, wanting to show a lot for it. So I, I think that's, uh, that's going to be exciting how it plays in the next few years. Um, as Angel Ventures, we have, receiving, we have been receiving pipeline from many countries. Uh, Mexico is obviously the, the, the big chunk, but we, we also get a significant pipeline from uh, countries like Argentina, Colombia, Peru, Chile, United States. And among that, you know, small percentage of other, we have actually gotten some Canadian, Canadian opportunities. And uh, I will talk a little bit more about this later, but out of our 19 investments, we actually have a Canadian company. And it turns out that our fund is actually Canadian because Canada has in place very, uh, very specific laws that support private equity and have done this for so many years. So most of the private equity and venture capital funds that you will find in Mexico are actually set up in Canada. So it turns out that we have an, an Ontario partnership in place and uh, all of our investors' money flows through Canada and then gets distributed back into Mexican opportunities, which is a little bit weird, but that's the way the, the cookie crumbles. Um, uh, we, we, we have invested with a lot of funds, we, American Express Ventures, Acción, Crunch Fund, Sierra Ventures, Riverwood, 500 Startups, Core, etc. And we, we like to define ourselves as very promiscuous funds. So any of you funds that join us together, trust me that we are always, we'll always lend a good ear and we're always uh, in search of the next best thing. And uh, statistically, we know that that might pretty much come from Canada or from Mexico or from anywhere in the world. but as long as you have some business to do in Mexico, we, we want to be uh, an ideal partner to, to make this work. Um, some other things, uh, the pipeline, you know, it's, it's kind of like robust because we, we, we literally get uh, hundreds, if not, if not thousands of deals. And sometimes, you know, as a generalist fund, it's, it's tough to, to how to, to choose the opportunities because, you know, I'm a generalist, my partner is a generalist, and in the morning we can get an e-commerce deal, and by the afternoon we need to uh, to revise a, a drone company or an agro-food technology company. So it's really tough, and that's why we have relied in in, uh, in many of these individuals and in, in these committees in order to make this happen, because it's, it's super important for us to have the the right kind of people that help, help us throughout the process 
And literally, it's a big chart that helps us in every single part that derives value for a fund. From the sourcing, to get to know the opportunities, to the investing, to, to the due diligence, in order to get to know who is doing what behind that opportunity, to the investing, how we will negotiate with many of these companies, to the post-investing, which basically talks about corporate governance and how we add value to these companies through business development, etc. And at some point, I'm, I'm pretty sure that this will be fundamental for our exit opportunities. These are current portfolio. Uh, I would not bore you with, with this, but in, enough to say that we have all the way from cancer, a, a cancer detection technology, to the largest Mexican, squ uh, Mexican Square, the, the payment processor, uh, to one of the largest e-commerce in, in the country as well, um, to the largest micro lender uh, in Kweski, and or or or, uh, or company or Canadian company, which is Bensi, which is this real-time spreadsheet uh, which integrates with e mainly with e-commerce players like Amazon and many others, because for them it's a, it's a software as a service company that aims to reduce the hassle uh, of a provider of these larger companies into the larger one. Because imagine if you're selling something to Amazon, many times you need to, uh, to integrate with Amazon using Excel spreadsheet. And Amazon might be using SAP or some other, something more robust. So Ben seems to be a technology that basically integrates all of these into one single language. Not an easy fit, but certainly we have the right talent pursuing that opportunity. And in terms of, of what is the, the, the Pacific Alliance opportunity, I love these slides, and I'm a true believer in in, um, in the, the words of the more, the merrier. And uh, this is what's, for me, very exciting. Um, the Pacific Alliance comprises the countries of Mexico, Chile, Colombia, and Peru. If we add these countries together, we're talking about 37% of the Latin American foreign direct investment, 36% uh, of, the, of the GDP among these four countries, and 50% of Latin American trade, which is not, um, not, not something easy to, 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 to say. Uh, if we add to that that uh, this will add to up to a $2 trillion economy, uh, we're arguably a, a little bit higher than Canada, but it's not fair to you guys because you're only like 30-something million and we're 225 million, right? Uh, but nevertheless, it certainly makes for, for an interesting uh, region to start, to, to start targeting. And there have been very interesting political efforts to integrate these markets and these countries. Uh, we're now pushing for free movement of trade and goods. Uh, there's this special visa process that would enable also for free movement of people among these regions. And, uh, and you know, the thing about Latin America is that there's seven economies that really have a weight on their own to, to, to be relevant in the world stage. And four of these economies are essentially Mexico, Chile, Colombia, and Peru. On the other hand, you have Brazil, which Brazil is facing some hardships right now. It's, it's the largest economy in the region for sure. But Brazil has always been a much more inward-looking economy. Um, then you have Argentina, which is in transition to say, to say what, probably what's going on right now. It's exciting what can happen with Argentina, but they, they're coming from uh, some tough years, uh, debt-related uh, issues and everything. So. Let's see how Argentina rejoins this world stage in full force. And by the way, Argentina has requested access to the Pacific Alliance trade bloc. And finally, we have Venezuela. I don't think I have to, to say a lot of things about Venezuela because we, we know that right now they're, it's, it's probably the, the, the least destination that you would like to invest, arguably next to Syria, which is very unfortunate for the region. Um, but well, uh, what, 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 what are we envisioning with the Pacific Alliance? Um, Latin America is a very fragmented market. I, I strongly believe that there's a lot of talent in places like Guatemala or Uruguay that has, you know, a great, uh, a great ecosystem and, and has a, a very strong rule of law. But the fact that, you know, markets really are the ones that are demanding the FDI and the up rounds and, and everything. So the fact that we're able to, to have this experiment of uniting these countries is quite interesting. And it's something that the larger funds like the Sequoias or the Andrews and Horwitz of the world have been talking to, to their Mexican counterparts that they're looking to invest larger tickets and create like a Latin American footprint. So the fact that this is happening is, is quite interesting. Um, the, the, then what we're looking to do in, in terms of companies, and this is what I would like to, for, for you to take from this presentation, is 
we're looking for companies that can be really competitive in Latin America. Uh, for example, we're we're looking at into a couple of deals in mining. Canada has a very strong mining legacy and tradition, and we're seeing startups out of Peru and Colombia. I'm sorry, Peru and Chile, which had very strong a uh, mining uh, industry as well, that might be competitive on a global scale. So I think there is a very direct synergy there in in how to work together in in the region, and these are. Com companies that we can potentially partner with a Canadian technology or Canadian fund in order to, to invest into these companies, uh, create a test market in these four countries, and then take it to, to a world stage and hopefully float some of these companies in, in the Canadian stock exchange. Uh, but that's just like an example of what we're looking for. Um, the fact that we're, we're looking for a... For a business models that are present throughout the region is because, again, the, the size question is really important for us. And what we're looking for uh, for Fund 2 is if we're seeing, for example, in, in this case, an e-commerce supplier for, uh, for car parts or, or car accessories, this is a trend that we are seeing among all of the countries in the Pacific Alliance and elsewhere. And actually, we have a, a very robust pipeline, uh, which has more, more than eight companies that are doing exactly the same. And if you are going to enter into, the, into Latin America through an acquisition, let's say that you are Pep Boys in the US, you probably want to deal with one company. You want to deal with one term sheet, with one uh, holding company in order to make an acquisition and have presence throughout the region. So it doesn't make any sense uh, if you're a Peruvian company to try to raise around and then compete with the Colombian company, for the Colom Colombian company to raise around and then come over to compete into Mexico, and the Mexican company, if they raise around, they have a big enough market and enough problems in Mexico to actually look elsewhere. So in the end, a Latin American entrepreneurs, what should they really understand is that if we don't start working together and thinking ourselves as a region, we are cannibalizing our own chances of having a better exit strategy. So. That's what the fund really aims to create, to create the right processes, the right governance to, to make many of these companies come together into single companies that might be more attractive for an IPO or for uh, a more successful exit strategy via an acquisition. And I think that obviously there, there may be a lot of questions in, in, uh, in the table in terms of how are you going to align all of these successful entrepreneurs? It's going to be like an ego battle between these many successful uh, people throughout the region, but the fact remains that the lack of the, the, the lack of capital, the, the access to finance, still is so complicated in these markets that the fact that we can come up and uh, guarantee them a round of up to 10 to 15 million dollars, they're willing to compromise uh, in order to maximize the chances of them being successful. So this is something that, that we really look to look forward to to work with many of these uh, you know smart uh, companies that are going to be regional powerhouses and from there there's the sky's the limit and we see in Canada a very important partner for us in order to exit to make acquisitions to to be a regional player for you guys and to help you discover the the, the opportunities in Latin America. So with that I leave you with my contact data and uh, follow us on, on Twitter, follow us on Facebook, and we're definitely here to, to help and to learn more about your businesses. Thank you very much.